This sermon was shortly after he had written U.S. President Jimmy Carter, warning that increased U.S. military aid would, I quote, undoubtedly sharpen the injustice and the political repression inflicted on the organized people whose struggle has often been for their most basic human rights. The Monsignor Romero Lecture is an annual lecture on a topic generally related to Latinx and Latin American liberation theology in, rec in recognition of his work as a defender of the marginalized. It addresses the contributions of Romero, but also it is informed by other forms of injustice from a liberative and post-colonial perspective. Monsignor Romero was canonized by Pope Francis on October uh, 18th, 2018, and is now San Romero, Saint Romero. Past lecturers here at Wesley include Nestor Miguez, Luis Rivera Pagan, Ana Maria Pineda, Carmen Nanco Fernandez, Daisy Machado, Edwin Aponte, Harold Racinos, Edgardo Colon Emmerich, Emmanuel Vargas, and the father of liberation theology, Gustavo Gutierrez. I would like to now invite our co-president of the Gente Latinx Student Association to come forward and begin with a prayer. Talina Sarmiento Beck. Thank you, Dean. Good afternoon. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather to learn together from one another. We thank you for, um, for this lecture and <clears throat> the work that you're doing here. We ask you to um, bless us and empower us to continue the ministry of Monsignor Romero, to continue denouncing any injustices that we find in our paths, in our ministries, um, to continue fighting against uh, structures that oppress any of your people, Father. I thank you uh, for Dr. Yonker for bringing her safe. And I just thank you for what you are doing in the lives of each of us. And bless us, Father, bless us together. Um, and I just pray all these in the name of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Talina. Muchas gracias. And just a reminder to those of you who are in your room, in this room, if you could please keep your masks on, unless you're here at the podium, and that there will be a reception immediately following this lecture in the refectory, and all of you are invited, and then we will continue the dialogue with our guest lecturer. Dr. Deborah Junker received her Doctor of Philosophy degree in 2003 from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Education and Congregational Studies. And just on a personal note, I uh, traveled to Garrett while they were there studying together, and my wife and I stayed in an apartment in the same apartment complex, and we didn't have a car. So they were very gracious, and when we had to go to the store and buy groceries, uh, uh, Tercio, her husband, would uh, take me around town and to do some errands. So it, we've been friends for a long time, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Dr. Junker also holds a Master of Arts in Christian Education from Christian Theological Seminary and a Master in Religious Science, Practical Theology from the Methodist University in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Dr. Junker also received a postgraduate specialization in psychopedagogy of early childhood and adolescence from the Methodist Institute of Higher Education in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and a licentiate in letters from the Methodist Institute of Higher Education in Sao Paulo. Currently, Dr. Junker is Associate Professor of Critical Pedagogies at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, which is my alma mater, 
in Evanston, Illinois. And the name of her lecture this evening is Collective Indignation, the Prophetic Duty of Our Times. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Juncker. Working. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon, visiting your beautiful campus and, and encounter some of the people here um, that I had the pleasure to, to exchange a few words. I thank you all for being here in person and those of you who are joining us on Zoom. Um, I want to express my special gratitude to Dean Phil Wigger uh, Ryo and for inviting me to be part of this special occasion. And also, I met uh, Veronica Miles right today, and she is uh, the chair of the this uh, lecture. I think I right. Her. Oh, yes, sure. Yes, yes, I forgot to do that. Um, I want to take this opportunity uh, to congratulate this institution uh, for hosting this annual conference uh, to honor and remember the life of Archbishop Oscar Romero, who Pope France canonized in, uh, in October 14, 2018, as Dean already mentioned. And I have the same quote in my presentation that he used here. But I, uh, I, I think that uh, his life continues being an example of a faithful follower of Christ. And I just want to thank you for hosting this lecture, also for, uh, the lives that you have taught uh, and touched by this, um, in this place, by your ministry. And also, I just want to mention that I, I bring greetings from Garrett Theological Seminary to all of you and um, to the president of this institution, uh, to faculty members, uh, the students, the staff, and um, in this institution. Thank you all for having me here. I also want to give a special thanks for Jasmine, <laughs> who have been uh, taking me um, in places here since I got here. So. Oh, here? Okay. Better? Okay. So maybe now I can Oh, are you doing that for me? Oh, so glad. Okay. Um, the the title I I added uh, just one a little word there, and I want to begin my talk uh, today. Collective indignation, imagination, the prophetic duty of our times, by calling attention to the lives of extraordinary human beings, their lives and work are closely linked to the Judeo-Christian prophetic tradition, and they continue to inspire our lives today. Oscar Romero and Paulo Freire. I, although they are from two different countries in Latin America, hold different vocations and have different goals in life. They share the passion and compassion for the least of these, the most marginalized people in society. I intend to show how their paths exemplify a genuine love for the forgotten in our communities, offering clues for Christians today to confront our current circumstances. And, 
Oh. Where is my help? Oh, maybe this is the way, right? Yeah, but it's not. She had the mouse over there, maybe. Is this? Okay, I will try this. Maybe. Oops, yes, now it is. <laughs> okay. The light of these two men is also reflected in this room. Let us take a deep breath in. Can we do that? And recognize in our bodies the how uh, or the extent to which indignation and imagination have led us to transform our own communities of accountability, our families, our communities, educational institutions. We have lived poetic and prophetic lives. Oops. The gifts of compassion, critical discernment, and creative imagination make poets and prophets extraordinary people uh, endowed with grace-filled spirit that allows them to experience life in transcendental ways. Poets are not afraid to venture out the orthodox demands of language using metaphors and evocative description to elucidate how the realities of their existence are recorded and processed through their body's experience and uh, memories. This almost irreverent ability to see beyond what is visible to the eye allows the poet to open new horizons and to cross different passages of consciousness illuminating what goes unnoticed for most people. In savoring the events and experiences of daily life, through their aesthetic sensibility, poets touch the souls of those who breathe or hear their most profound utterances. Poets, through their evocative work, sometimes undress, unmask, and open forbidden recesses of our souls so that we can see more clearly the things not so visible to the naked eye or our fields of vision. Our times, other times, they use coded words to protect what has been revealed to them. Furthermore, amid pain and heartbreak, Poets provide us new eyes, new images to interpret reality. The eyes of poets are uncontrolled by conventions, unshamed and undomesticated. Therefore, uh, they have uh, they are out of orthodoxy and institutional demands. They remain outside of chronos, free of a structural bonds, bonds and able to imagine, to dream and to hope. Uh, like exquisite cooks who prepare their dishes combining experimenting and balancing different flavors, colors, fragrances, and textures, poets 
offer us metaphors and images that are meant to be appreciated with gusto, with a spiritual discernment and sensorial presence. By presenting the possibilities of seeing reality anew, poets have the power to animate our imaginations so that we can conjure up new modes of flourishing in the world. Prophets, on the other hand, are dissonant voices who do not feel intimidated by the hegemonic power and who are eager to employ their acute capacity to interpret their social cultural context towards the reparation of precarious life conditions. According to Rabbi Abraham Heschel, what poets recognize as poetic inspiration, the prophets call it di divine revelation. And like a poet, they are gifted with sensibility, enthusiasm, and tenderness, and above all, with a way of thinking imaginatively. Prophecy is thus the product of poetic imagination. Compelled by the commitment to present an alternative interpretation of reality, the task of the prophet, prophet is to help those who have been persuaded to accept their suffering and the oppression to which they are subject to believe as destiny, to gain a critical consciousness of their reality. Recognize what's false, dehumanizing, manipulative and unjust is part of the prophet's duty. As Walter Brugman puts it, the work of the prophet is nothing less than an assault on the consciousness of the empire aimed at nothing less than dismantling of the empire, both in its social practices and its mythic pretensions. The task of the prophet is therefore twofold, not only as a censor and accuser, but also as, as a defender and counselor who brings the world into a divine focus. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, prophets are portrayed as the spokespersons of God. They are people whose words can concurrently bring judgment, hope, distress, and comfort. They are individuals who rashly confront power structures and unethical actions that subjugate people. Equipped with the sensitivity of the poets, they see and feel the pain of the people and denounce the abuses of oppressive and unjust structures affecting the more vulnerable in society. And yet, prophets rebuke while at the same time announce what needs to be done to improve the, life, the living conditions for all, calling everyone to an urgent conversion of the heart, a metanoia. This conversion of, uh, does just mean changing your mind or actions because you have been told to, or simply regretting something you have done. It is not enough to tear, uh, tear, tear your clothes and repentance. It is necessary to rip, to tear, to shatter, to lacerate the heart and uproot the oppressive structures that continue to produce their victims. It in, this is conversion. It implies a continuous process of maturation, mindfulness, commitment to the personal journey and historical reality consciously and lovingly. It is to see the face of God in the faces of the people that we meet, that we encounter. And I see the faces of God in each of you this afternoon. 
A conversion of heart, of heart was precisely what's happened to Oscar Romero even many years of serving as a priest and bishop. On February 22, 1977, he was elected Archbishop of San Salvador. Rome selected him because he was timid, conservative, uh, and opposed to politics. Those in power who wanted to maintain the power structures and change were pleased with his appointment. Yet, many of his priests despised his disdain for the prophetic church as envisioned by liberation theology. Some of them also were cognizant that while a bishop, he sided with the government and condemned the subversive behavior of priests, accusing them of being political and not Christians. However, this changed after the death of his friend and colleague, Jesuit father Rutilio Grande, killed as a punishment for helping peasants to get organized to seek freedom and transformation of their reality. The murder happened less than a month after Romero's appointment, and he was deeply saddened by the brutal assassination and understood that Father Grande's death was not isolated from the thousands of men, women, and children murdered by the military and paramilitary death squad. Some believe that the tragic death of Father Grande and two peasants were the occasion for his radical conversion and his transformation into a prophet in the making. It was an eye opener, leading him to see the misery of the violence inflicted on the poor and prompted the conversion of his heart. For three years, Archbishop Romero's voice echoed through El Salvador, crying out against murder and torture urging his people to seek the peace and forgiveness necessary to build a more just society. He was aware that harsh criticisms on behalf of his people would have consequences. Romero became a target of government controlled media almost daily and received numerous death threats. In one of his diary entries in August 1977, he says, see how the accusations against the prophets of all time are the same. When the prophet bothers the consciousness of the selfish or of those who are not building with God's plans, he is a nuisance and must be eliminated, murdered through into a pit persecuted, not allowed to speak the word that annoys. It's always the same. The prophet has to speak of society's sin and call to conversion as the church is doing today in San Salvador, pointing out whatever would enthrone sin in El Salvador's history and calling sinners to be converted just as Jeremiah did. In this last sermon Romero preached, he said, I have no ambition for power. And so I freely tell those in power what is good and bad. And I do the same with any political group. It is my duty. And addressing the military directly, he went on to say, and we heard this before, I want to make a special appeal to soldiers, National Guardsmen, and policemen. Each of you is one of us. The peasants you kill are your own brothers and sisters. When you hear a man telling you to kill, remember God's words, thou shalt not kill. No soldier is obliged to obey a law contrary to the law of God. In the name of God, in the name of our 
torment people, I beseech you, I implore you, in the name of God, I command you to stop the repression. Just days before his death, in a, an interview with an editor of Mexican magazine, Excelsior, Romero made an eloquent statement worthy of a true prophet. He said, I need to say that as a Christian, I do not believe in death without resurrection. If they kill me, I will rise again in the people of El Salvador. If they manage to carry out their threats as of now, I offer my blood for the redemption and resurrection of El Salvador. If God accepts the sacrifice of my life, they may, then may my blood be the seed of liberty and the sign that hope will soon become a reality. May my death, if it is accepted by God, be for the liberation of my people as a witness of hope in what is to come. You can tell them that if they succeed in killing me, I pardon and bless those who do it. A bishop may die, but the church of God, which is in the people, will never die. The gift of the prophet is a gift of discernment, of a movement toward the future to be built. His voice cuts through the oppressive silence of indifference. Her journey is a path of love, awareness, understanding, collaboration, commitment, and reciprocity. Thus, she seeks to invite others into this journey of discernment of discerning reality. However, to gain a critical perspective of reality, one must need to engage in the process of conscientization that Freire describes in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. For him, it is not enough to read the word, and we could include here, read the word of God. We need to read the world that is the reality that surround us. Freire began to articulate his educational philosophy by emphasizing the importance of education for critical consciousness. He was aware of his country. Uh, he was aware of his country's social problems and motivated by his vision of the human beings in the teaching of his faith to love his neighbors. He uh, then start to think about his reality and the reality of people to, uh, with whom he met. For Freire, the history of humanity is the starting point for his theological reflection. His religious convictions grounded in a God concerned with the well-being of all would become the central element of his pedagogical praxis. Freire admits he did not feel comfortable speaking openly about his faith. However, he never renounced his Christian vision uh, guided by the values of the gospel, especially the notion of a liberating God who empathizes with the oppressed people and rejects the oppressive forces and instructors that try to dehumanize them. Consequently, his faith was a source of strength compelling him to work on behalf of the oppressed, as he declares, when I went to um, first to meet with workers and peasants in Recife's slums to teach and learn from them, I have to confess, I did that pushed by my Christian faith. For him, Christian faith was not an excuse to accept oppression passively, but a call to a transforming praxis that encompasses prophecy and hope. Hence, a faith that anchors itself 
in passivity and accommodation is an, an alienating faith that corroborates and promotes inequities and sustains harm. It is a faith that contradicts the Christian message of love, God, and one's neighbors. Love in this respect is not an abstraction, but it materializes in concrete actions of solidarity and justice in the face of oppressive socioeconomic cultural circumstances. Freire also underscores the importance of ha having hope. He calls attention to sustain what he considers the ontological vocation of humankind, humanization. It is impossible to imagine a world where everybody belongs to the human capacity to hope. In this perspective, he reminds the matrix of hope is the same as the educability of human beings, the incompleteness of their being, which became conscious. It would be an aggressive contradiction if unfinished and aware of the incompleteness, the human beings do not participate in an ongoing process of seeking hope. This process is education. But precisely because we find ourselves subject to an endless number of constraints, obstacles difficult to overcome, dominant influences of fatalist conceptions of history, the power of neoliberal ideology whose perverse ethics is based on the logic of the market, never perhaps we have had more need to stress through the educational praxis the sense of hope needed today. Hence, among several fundamental practice of educators, whether liberal or conservative, it notes the following. Change is difficult, but possible. According to Freire, analysis, he makes explicit his concern with the oppressive nature of institutional churches insisting that the task of Christians is to combat all forms of oppression. In his view, God works not on behalf of the power, but for the liberation of the oppressed. Furthermore, in a letter to a theology student, like, your, like you here, he says, the word of God is inviting me to recreate the word, not for my brothers and sisters domination, but for their liberation. Listening to the word of God does not mean acting like empty vessels waiting to be filled with that word. That is why I insist that a utopian and prophetic theology leads naturally to a cultural action for liberation and hence to conscientization. In his tenure as a consultant at the World Council of Churches in Geneva, he was able to articulate better his critique of the church, which, le uh, which according to him had forgotten its proper role. In a selection of articles of uh, Freire's lectures published during, uh, between 70 and 72, there are explicit reference to how he understands the role of Christians and the church. Freire draws from a Christian tradition to build upon themes such as hope, justice, freedom, and prophecy, denouncement and announcement, challenging Christians to embrace a more coherent position between their words and their actions. For Freire, Having faith is not a problem. The problem is claiming to have it and not at the same time contradicting that faith. So in the book of politics of education, Frey expands on his understanding of what it means to act prophetically. Consistent with his prophetic vision, he asserts that churches are not abstract entities, but institutions inserted in history. 
As a result, they cannot afford to be neutral since neutrality means supporting the status quo. He says, wash one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless. Does not mean to be neutral, but to be on the side of the powerful. Also, he adds that change will not happen through sermons, humanitarian work, and charity alone. He adverts, or because of that, in, not, uh, in the last analysis, he says, quote, he, in the last analysis, the basic presupposition of such action is the illusion that the hearts of men and women can be transformed while the social structures that make those hearts sick are left intact and unchanged. Accordingly, the radical transformation of the social structures requires a change perspective that is not automatic or mechanical. Evoking another Christian symbolism, um, I think that I missed showing this before. Evoking another Christian symbolism, Freire stresses that the church and all people need to undergo their own Easter process. They need to die to the myth of superiority, purity of soul, wisdom, and neutrality, or the myth of inferiority, impurity, and absolute ignorance. According to him, they can be born again and be transformed. The Easter, which results in the changing of consciousness, but must be exist existentially experienced because it is not a mere celebratory event, but praxis. Freire recognized, however, that this is not an effortless process since the necrophilic death loving is unable to accept the biophilic life loving, the experience of Easter. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis that Easter becomes the death that makes life possible. For him, the experience of rebirth is only possible at the side of the oppressed through the liberation process, which points toward a conscientization process. Such process of critical consciousness implies a dialectical unity between action and reflection, praxis, a reasonable attempt to reveal the reality that undoubtedly encompasses a political involvement to unveil the dream of a transformed reality. Freire says, dreaming is not only a necessary politic, a political act, but is also an integral part of the histor historic social manner of being a person. It is part of human nature, which within history is a permanent process of becoming. Thus, I keep insisting ever since pedagogy of the oppressed, there is no authentic utopia apart from the tension between the denunciation of a present situation become more and more intolerable and the annunciation, the announcement of a future to be created, built politically, aesthetically, and ethically by us women and men. Utopia implies this denunciation and proclamation, but it does not permit uh, the tension between the two to die away with production of a future previously, previously announced. From a prophetic perspective, transformation cannot happen passively. It implies the analysis of the social structures, denouncing their unjust arrangements and announcing their radical change to a political praxis in the service of human liberation. According to him, 
Thinking of tomorrow is thus engaging in prophecy, except that the prophet in this case is not an old man with a long and gray beard. On the contrary, the prophets here are those who are found in what they live, in what they see and apprehend, in what they understand, who are rooted in their epistemological curiosity exercise alert to the signs they seek to comprehend. In 1997, shortly before his death, Freire was actively working on what would be his next book with a clear vision of his humanistic love and political indignation. He writes, there is no possibility of we could think of tomorrow, whether a nearer or more distant one, without finding ourselves in a permanent process of emergence from today without being drenched in the time which we live, touched, touched by its challenges, provoked by its problems, insecure before the insanity that the announces disasters, taken by a just rage in light of profound injustice, which express in terrifying levels, the human capacity for ethical transgression. Also, there is no possibility of thinking of tomorrow without being encouraged by testimonies of greater loving of life, which is strength in us that so needed times in battle Hope. Freire asserts that reflecting on things that touch our existence is prophesizing because prophets seek to understand reality by engaging in it. They do this not in isolation, but by confronting the present circumstances, reading the signs, and speaking the truth to power. However, the prophetic announcing is not a, fat a fatalistic hunch or charade, but a form of intervention in the world, bringing to light the earnings that have been denied so that transformation can take place. According to Freire, only utopians can be prophetic, reacting against a culture of silence without losing hope. Oppressors, and reactionaries cannot be utopians because they cannot be prophetic and hopeful. Being a prophetic voice on behalf of the poor, the marginalized, and the discriminated is a task that we must engage to build another world where justice, beauty, equality, and democratic relations can thrive. In this context, we are called to read our reality with critical eyes, with critical awareness, illuminated by pedagogies of indignation and hope. Indeed, today's prophets cannot accomplish their vocation unless they are invested in the remarkable labor of eliciting the process of critical consciousness, which implies the denouncement of all that is inhuman and the announcement of a transformed reality. As Paulo Freire reminds us, the prophetic church must move continuously, constantly dying and always being born. He invites us to make this crossing, this travesia, not dissociating our worldliness from our transcendentality, but leaving both in their fullness. So I'm here thinking over there, but I cannot be just thinking over there. I have to live my life here and now and making the, the effort to change my surroundings, my, the, the things that are um, need of change. In this way, Freire's work invites us to engage this process of conscien consciousness by activating our imagination to poetic, prophetic language. Uh, a commitment, oops. A commitment to the world requires a commitment 
of history, a commitment to history. Such a commitment challenges us to recognize, criticize, and change the unjust structure of a society that causes suffering. Such a commitment may lead to conflicts and persecutions. Such a commitment can even ask of us that we commit our whole beings to the cause of justice and peace. Freire says that critical education must never lack a lucid perception of reality that reveals the possibility of intervening in the world through concrete action that dream that the dream of those committed to justice. How one interferes in the world arises from the awareness and competence of reading the world critically. For that to happen, one needs perception, vision, and hope. A perception of the crucial problems of our context, a vision of how it should be, and a hope that nourishes and makes possible the realization of that vision. Thus, it is not enough to have an image of a better world. It is necessary to work with hope to realize this vision, to change what is wrong. My presence in the world cannot be neutral. It cannot be static, unconcerned, waiting for others to do for me, work for me, be critical for me, and imagine alternatives for me. No, I need to do my job. I must invest my time understanding what is wrong with the world, what is happening around me, why things are this way or that way. I need to recognize that I cannot achieve any change individually. I need to start working with others to change what is absurd, insane, and un unacceptable. I need to dream about how to build new relationships and new utopias with others. I cannot keep talking without engaging in practice consistent with the things I want to accomplish. Practice that will dismantle the system of oppression that although we need, we did not create them, we became their helpers through actions and omissions. It would, have, would perhaps be opportune in the current pandemic context to remember that in addition to the martyrs martyrs of Christianity, there are many collective and anonymous martyrs in our shared history. And so we need to cultivate the sensitivity to, of our eyes to see the martyrdoms that happen before our eyes every day. The public victims of imperialism, colonialism, patriarchy, ethnocentrism, racism, and so many other viruses that infect our society and make us sick. One just need to remember those who die for the love of Christ and those who are killed in the name of Christ. As was the case of thousands of indigenous people in America, victims of extractive trades, latifundio, hydroelectric plants, multinational, multinational mining projects. These initiatives decimated nations, exploited, exploited natural resources, imposed a colonialist and Eurocentric education, and did not respect the culture of history or and history of the first peoples of Americas. Genocide, ecocide, femicide are practiced daily without consistent and intentional resistance. Observing this scenario, I'm forgetting to change this. Uh, observing this scenario, we may feel overwhelmed and discouraged. 
pandemic made an impact on all of us. Even I would say that even things that we didn't realize yet has impacted us profoundly. And if we think about those um, situations, circumstances that we are lived in, we may feel overwhelmed and discouraged to continue our work, our ministry, our life. But I want to invite you um, to, uh, based on or inspired by Freire, to think about this uh, with a new perspective, with a, 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 from a perspective of hope. He says that, uh, Freire says, the mechanisms that generate discriminatory manifestations of race, gender, and class should never be reasons for weakening, weakening our convictions. According to him, the emblematic dehumanization of our context is not a cause of hopelessness, but a reason to fight in hope. The critical perception of these tricks becomes indispensable for the culture of resistance. Uh, oh, I think I have the wrong piece here. Forget about this. <laughs> uh, faced with a war uh, from the hopeful perspective can you just put the oh yeah, the, the stop share yeah from the hopeful perspectives uh, of paulo freire we are challenged to recognize and restructure our current context on other foundations guided by other power relations or as Boaventura de Souza Santos says, adjusted by other social and epistemological alternatives. Faced with a world shaken by the pandemic, catastrophes, and by war, I propose that we have a posture of collective anger to put indignation into action to educate our struggles, our resistance, by redirecting our educational tasks and prophetic vocation. This educational practice cannot despise the subjects or impose um, a hegemonic knowledge on them. It needs to be formulated from emerging epistemologies of the global South from multiple perspectives, different accents, new approaches, and new linguistic expressions. Certainly, Freire, as one of its most important protagonists, could provide some clues for us to start this journey. Then he would invite us to dream, reminding us that dream does not mean running away from the world escaping from it, but bringing to reality the good that is desired for oneself and for others. He would advise that our dream should be dreamed collectively. Therefore, challenged by or confront, confronting the pedagogy of cruelty proliferating in our world today, I believe that only collectively we can overcome. Collectively, we will be able to think, to prophesy, take a stand and build something strong enough, angry enough and full of indignation to fight against the negligence, indifference, violence and individualism that recruit new followers every day. So my invitation today for us to collectively commit to walking this earth, remembering what 
irritates us, what causes us indignation, while invoking the wisdom of our ancestors and predecessors who entrusted us with the responsibility of developing eyes of poets and mouth of prophets. In Esperanza, obrigada. Thank you very much, Dr. Junker. Uh, we are going to prioritize questions from those of you following on Zoom, uh, because those of us physically here in the room will have more time to engage our lecture in at the reception. Uh, so I see there is a question in the chat box. Uh, to, actually, I see another one popping up. Can you see it there? Yep. Um, you will need to restate uh, it for the people who are physically in the room. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, to where, from where to start. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. There's a question here from Cheryl Ann Elfand, who asks, how does the prophetic call relate to the Russian assault on Ukraine? How do we address this now? Yeah, this is a, a, a question that is in our minds, right? I will not uh, answer your question directly uh, because there are very different uh, layers um, and complications. It's very complex here. But from my perspective, as a freedom, um, um, educator, I would say that we need to, no matter what the situation is, uh, we need to be uh, aware and to be um, uh, what he calls like when he says to read the word and the word that means to read what is like what we read on the paper, what we read, the narrative, the discourse, we need to think about uh, uh, more globally, more uh, encompassing all the poss possibilities. We have to have a critical understanding of what is going on, not only in terms of one country against the other, but what are the subliminal questions that are present there and how they are in some ways informed by uh, uh, neoliberalism and capitalism and the, the right of the land, of taking the right of people and why. So we need to ask before, uh, I think her, uh, how is the prophetic call relate to Russian assault on Ukraine? I would say the, the prophetic call is for us to understand and to read and to understand and to study history, to study the political uh, things uh, that is going on, the, the, the economic uh, situation in both uh, nationally speaking, but also internationally speaking. So I think prophetic, to be prophetic is to understand the reality. It's not to be against one or another, but it's to understand the whole uh, history of, of how we are doing this. And I think when we have this critical consciousness, then we can act based on our understanding of our critical understanding of what is going on and not just take to uh, a big problem today is uh, media illiteracy right so what is fake news <laughs> and what is new truth 
we are a lot of people are, are is speaking about we are Paul's uh, uh, um, truth, right? Moment. So where to look for what are the sources to inform us? The media, the history, the, the consequences of economic um, enterprise, what, where are, are we seeking our information, our understanding of the reality? I think that is prophetic for me. It's not the end, it's the process to get there. That would be my answer. Thank you. One more question from Gordon Pleasance, who asks, what is the relationship of Paulo Freire's concepts of patiently impatient and emancipatory hope to real spiritual social transformation? Yeah, this is a very dear expression of Freire, uh, uh, patient and patient, because he said, uh, like, I cannot be only patient about things that are wrong. Because if I, I be patient, I may end, uh, end up being uh, accommodated, complex with what is wrong. So I have to kind of uh, live this dialectically because I have to be patient in terms of continuing fight for a transformation, for a change. So in that sense, I will be patient with what is wrong but at the same time, I will be patient fighting for that to change. So he, he used these two uh, terms saying that we cannot be only or exclusively patient or exclusively impatient. Because sometimes if you are too impatient, uh, let me say something that I hope, that I believe would be a better way of living together, I may not accomplish to see it in my generation. But if I just dismiss that because I will not see it, I will not fight to, to change it. And so some people who will come after me will be able to, to have that. So uh, this is very important for us and for the dimension of, of uh, being a prophetic voice. So we are fighting, resisting, confronting what is wrong, but at the same time, being patient because things will not change overnight. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a wonderful uh, place to, to pause. And again, we want to thank Dr. Juncker for this wonderful lecture and conversation. I want to thank all the people who are online on Zoom who participated, and thank you for all your, your comments in the chat box. And for those of you who are physically here in the room, you are all invited to join us for the reception, which is downstairs in the refectory. You can either take the elevator down the hall or the stairs that are immediately outside this, this door to your left. Why don't you please join me in thanking again, Dr. Juncker, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. concludes the lecture for this portion of the lecture for this evening. Look forward to seeing you at the reception.